In this lecture, we will be discussing how to correct a perineal hernia. This is the last lecture video of this chapter. Let's start. Perineal hernia is the protrusion of abdominal organs through the pelvic diaphragm. This results from progressive weakness and subsequent unilateral or bilateral failure of the pelvic diaphragm which is made up of the paired medial coccygeal muscles and the levator ani. This weakness allows the rectum, pelvic, and or abdominal contents to displace into the perineum. This condition appears as a bulge on the lateral side of the tail base, which could extend ventrally. Males are found to be more prone to this condition because it is believed that their perineal diaphragm is weaker than that of females. Also, females perineal diaphragms end more cranially than the males. Affected patients also exhibit straining during defecation. Patients with cystitis, urinary tract infection and or obstruction, anal sacculitis, diarrhea, and constipation are predisposed to perineal hernias. Definitive diagnosis of perineal hernias is done through a digital rectal examination. To do this, a lubricated gloved finger is gently inserted into the patient's rectum. If you feel a lateral deviation or diverticulum of the rectum and colon into the side where the hernia is, then that is a confirmatory diagnosis. This deviation causes fecal accumulation and subsequent patient straining. The perineal hernia may be palpated and be attempted to be reduced by gently pushing the contents back into the abdominal cavity. If it can be reduced, it's one sign it is a hernia. If the urinary bladder herniated and happened to be strangulated, which is a common thing in patients with perineal hernia, this will appear as a tense enlargement. Skin will have a bluish-red discoloration. And there is the presence of serum exudates. Of course, taking lateral abdominal radiographs, which include the perineal region, helps to ascertain what specific organs have been displaced into the hernia. In this case, a part of the descending colon and rectum was displaced into the hernia. This radiograph is showing the herniated urinary bladder that is seen here with the dog catheterized. So again, the importance of your diagnostic imaging in finding out what are the organs and structures that could be inside that hernia or that could be strangulated by the hernial ring um, would be best seen with the diagnostic imaging, just to emphasize its importance. The patient may be positioned on its ventral recumbency with a tail extended and secured upwards to visualize the surgical site. The table may be tilted up with its backside up to elevate the caudal part of the body. Some have also chosen to place the patient on its dorsal recumbency with the legs hyperextended cranially to tilt the perineal area upward. Bottom line, in regards of the decision as to what position the patient will be, it's up to the surgeon. Since the anal region is very close to the surgical site, it is sealed with a purse string suture to prevent any contamination of the surgical site. Reminder, do not forget to remove this suture after the surgery. Sometimes client called, calls the vet after perineal herniography, claims that their patient or their pet is still straining, st still not able to defecate until they find out that the purse string suture was not removed after the surgery. So it's not a mystery that it's not defecating. Its anus is literally sealed shut. So do not forget that. 
The goal of a perineal herniography is to reconstruct the pelvic diaphragm and replace the herniated contents back to the abdominal cavity. So, how to start this? A curvilinear incision is made cranial to the coccygeal muscles, curving over the hernial bulge, 1 to 2 centimeters lateral to the anus. Be prepared for bleeding and address this through gentle pressure and cautery. Undermine through the subcutaneous tissue and fat. While doing this, you need to identify the herniated contents and dissect them from their fibrous attachments, if present. This is a very careful procedure since some fibrous attachments tend to be very tough and if we try to remove them, it could tear through the serosa of the organs. Check the viability and the signs of these organs. Check for signs of congestion and necrosis. Once you're sure that they are viable, you could put them back into the abdomen. Pack the defect or the existing hole with a moistened sponge during apposition. Identify the muscles that hold the pelvic diaphragm and try to oppose them. If the herniation happens suddenly or acutely, these muscles can be opposed. Use a simple interrupted pattern with a non-absorbable suture to reconstruct these muscles. However, it is common that the cause of a perineal hernia is because of the muscles of the pelvic diaphragm weakening. It is not unusual, unusual rather, to notice that these muscles, even if you are able to identify them, are atrophied already and cannot be opposed relative to the size of the defect. May it be a chronic presentation or acute presentation, you have to try to identify the muscles that originally made up this pelvic diaphragm. Remember? the muscles that are comprising the pelvic diaphragm. After you have replaced the organs back into the abdominal cavity, you are now assessing the area that you need to reconstruct. And what if that defect is this big? Remember, you are doing this herniography to seal that hole shut. Originally, if the muscles that or originally in this area, if they could be identified and opposed together with minimal tension, then your problem is solved. But most of the time, the muscles around it are atrophied and you will not be able to identify them. And even if you do, they are not in a good condition to hold this hole closed. This is where we use a surgical mesh. A surgical mesh is can be made from absorbable material or a non-absorbable suture material. Basically, it's a net. It will serve as the pelvic diaphragm in cases when the muscles cannot be opposed. It is fit around the hole and secured around this defect with simple interrupted sutures. The This mesh is meant to to take up the responsibility of the muscle. So it needs to be securely um, fastened or sutured around the defect because this will dictate if your herniography will be successful or not. This will dis dictate if you will have a recurrence of the hernia or not. The subcutaneous layer is then closed with a simple continuous pattern using an absorbable suture. The skin may be closed with the usual options. It is up to you. You have to consider the skin tension around that area. You have to consider that originally that area is expanded and has loose skin at some point. So you have to consider those factors in choosing how you close the skin. A cold compress is recommended for the first two to three days post-op to minimize the inflammation and hemorrhage in that area. Stool softeners are prescribed for one to two months post-surgery 
But of course, if you notice in your follow-ups that the animal is defecating normal already, then you may stop the stool softeners. Some would even consider a diet change for a, a wet diet with highly digestible nutrients just so that the resultant um, feces would not be as hard. Um, again, for any surgery, monitor for any signs of infection and unwarranted inflammation. So, that was quite a lengthy discussion on the surgeries of the abdominal cavity. We're up to 10 lecture videos. And I'm happy to report that this is the last lecture video for the fourth chapter. But before we finish, I have attached a video of perineal herniography. Make sure to watch it. Compile your questions about this chapter and let me know through a PM or an email. Thank you and see you in chapter 5. Welcome to Vet Ranch, I'm Dr. Matt, and I'm glad you're here. This is Pablo. Pablo is probably a five-year-old Chihuahua. He was at the local pound and was scheduled to be euthanized because he has a little issue back here. This is a perennial hernia. Um, when I squeeze this area, I can feel his intestines moving in there. So his intestines have come through his pelvis and have herniated out into this perineum area. Um, and he can still poop and he can still pee, so it's not an emergency situation, but he does need to get this fixed because it can become a bad situation pretty quickly. He also has a little cut over here on this leg. Not sure what happened there, but he's a very sweet little dog. I'm a little nervous right now. We are going to fast him overnight and then do his surgery tomorrow. I've never done one of these surgeries before, but I've researched up on it and I think I can make it work. So we're going to try to make him a much more happy, comfortable dog tomorrow. We'll check with you then. Good morning. Pablo is under anesthesia and show you this you can see his intestines moving around in that thing we're going to get him prepped for surgery and get started have them all scrubbed up and you can see how bruised this skin is um, and that's why he's been so painful back there just stretching out that skin pretty bad so about to make an incision this is his anus right here i'm going to cut kind of an elliptical incision right under there that should be about where the hernia is coming through and we'll kind of see what we have. All right, we are in, and here are all the intestines out um, behind the pelvis where they should not be. They're coming through a little hole right here. This is the rectum coming right out here. That's why we have this plugged right here so nothing comes out. So here's a rectum, and here's a bunch of intestines pushing around the side of it. I'll exteriorize these so you can see how many there are in there. Um, but yeah, a good bunch of them. So I'm just going to work on pushing all these back in and then we have to close the defect in the muscles that let all that through. Alright, here's the sac. See it's full of fluid down there. It's just full of fluid and bowels. I've pushed most of it back in here. I'm just getting the rest of it in there. Um, and the bowel is supposed to move around in the body so you basically just get it back in there and there's enough fluid that it'll just kind of move around and go back to where it needs to go. So, got the bowel all back. That is the big hole that should not be there. So. To fix this, basically I just need to tie these external anal sphincter muscles and these muscles all together over this spot so that nothing can poke back through here. I have it tied in three places up here on the top, but I still have um, about a half pinky width hole right there. And the issue in all the literature I read, um, there's plenty of muscle to tie through down here. but. If you hear that, this is all just bone here and just a little bit of light tissue covering it. So I'm just dissecting down further, trying to find something of structure to tie up here to the anal sphincter. That's my issue right now. All right, I have everything sutured up there where the hernia was. Now I've opened it up to the extent of where all the swelling was. And uh, I just have way too much skin now. Um, if I didn't trim some of this, he'd just have a big floppy area. So I'm going to trim this extra skin and then suture it up.
All done here. Um, I have sutures and staples going all the way down. I have a drain tube placed in here. It runs all the way under this incision because there's a lot of dead space and it's going to continue to leak. But I got all the um, extra skin cleared out and I think this is going to heal up pretty nicely. Um, they actually said in the book, you can see he still has his testicles down here, they said 90%, 95% of the cases are in unneutered male dogs. So um, they recommend neutering at the same time. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip them over now and neuter him. After we flipped him over, we noticed all this bruising here, a little bit over here. He must have got pretty torn up, I would assume by another dog, and that's probably what caused all of his issues, but he is very bruised, probably pretty sore. Neuter is done now. I'm going to take off these little dew claws and they're just attached by skin, a little thin layer of skin. There's no bone under there, so this electrocauter unit. I'm just gonna basically cauterize them right off. And that's all you'll need to do. Got the little dew claw right there. One more on this side. That's it. I'll wake him up. All right, it's day after surgery. Pablo is doing well. Um, his drain tube really isn't draining as much as I thought it would, which is good. Um, the incision all looks good, and he seems to be um, in not too much pain today. He's just very nervous. This will probably be our last video with him. We're going to send him with a foster um, so that he can heal up there because um, he's kind of nervous in our kennel. So anyway, we're probably not going to see Pablo again for an update video, but thanks for supporting Vet Ranch. All of his procedure was paid for by donations from our YouTube viewers. So thanks for watching. See you next time. See you in our next chapter. Thanks, guys.